Hi, and welcome back to the Lifestyle Show with me, Pam Joseph. This is the bit that I'm a bit squeamish about. You know, um, it's all well and good to be um, uh, interviewing your, maybe even your, I don't know, your daughter, or maybe your niece, and maybe your nephew, which I've all done. But to interview someone who um, is regarded as one of the <laughs> most classical top uh, black actors, British black actors in England, is rather, you know, something that you have to take a strand on um but anyway here we go and he hope he's not going to rib me and i hope he's not going to just tease me but we have got on the show ladies and gentlemen the, the one of them to me best British black actors stage screen and theater <sighs> Pat and joseph good evening <laughs> I am the inflated ego of Patterson Joseph, who has been blown apart by all the praise he has received from his sister. And in all my 50 and more years upon this earth, I have never received such praise from her. Strange, she does it publicly. Anyway, hello, everybody. <laughs> Are you, Mike? Are you? Are you? This is weird. <laughs> you gave me, you gave me the opportunity. What else was I going to do? Of course, <laughs> you are you are so privileged to be on our show. Everybody, all of the all of the lifestyle crew were buzzing. I do feel privileged. Really, 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 this time, really, really, is he coming on this time? Really, is he? Oh, yes, he is. Look at him. He's here. Well, I watch you every week, so um, I'm very excited to. Oh, be uh, I feel very privileged to be okay. sharing sharing all the sharing a sofa with you. There you go. I have to look. I have to look that way. It's just a blank wall here, but I what, know. What if we've we talk like this? We've got so much to say, Pat. Because yeah, what if we talk like this though? Just for can we, if you turn your way, so like we're having a proper conversation for five seconds. Can I do this? And this looks good. <laughs> this is so good. Maybe they don't like it so much. So let's talk, Pat. Yes. I mean, cool, blimey. Um, I'm not going to say what I know, so I have to do treat you as someone. Because everyone needs to know how. When did you get the bug, Patterson? Um, well, uh, long story, short story. Let us get the short. Because <laughs> yeah, because you know how long my stories are. <laughs> exactly. <yeah. laughs> uh, basically, I was a chef, and I was um, asked to uh, clear some uh, trolleys. Uh, in a hospital I worked in and we cleared these trolleys and the floor was just covered in cockroaches and there was a part of me that thought this is a sign <laughs> a big biblical sign that says this maybe isn't the perfect place for you to work plus it felt quite claustrophobic as a thing to do all my life work inside one building or you know four walls and do that daily and so I thought what can I do that's creative and I remembered our auditioning failing but auditioning for the National Youth Theatre when I was about 14 and I dug out these leaflets and this rejection letter and the rejection letter was it's so funny because I picked it out I don't know why I even kept it but I picked it out and it's and it you know obviously said you've not been successful and I remember looking at it and thinking if I have grandchildren I don't want to be telling them if they ask the question did you ever try to become an actor? And I'd say, yeah, once. You know, I'd feel that was really lame. So I thought, you know what, let me try again. Uh, and so I had, amongst all the papers that I had at that time, a leaflet for a youth theatre called The Cockpit in Marylebone. And that's where I went. And from that point on, I think I gave up my job within a month or two. I thought, this is what I want to do. I did the summer uh, play. And then, um, I mean, I was with people like, Lenny James, you know, who's a great actor even yeah. then, you know. Yeah. Um, and Sophia Canedo was like a year behind us. It was a great place. And it was also given money by the Inner London Education Authority, which was run okay. by Ken Livingston at the time and the Greater London Council. Yeah. And Margaret Thatcher hated them. Yes. But they were a great organisation for giving money to the arts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I went to drama school twice on a, on a grant because I was in Brent, which was a staunchly Labour... Um, borough and uh, come on Brent and they had this um, grant system that it's difficult to get a grant now so you're looking for bursaries to try to do the arts and that's difficult you know so it, it's a different world but anyway that youth theatre was very well run and we had professional and, writers and, and the year of that 
Awesome. Let's talk about the year of that because I'm going to go with the sequence of what I've got. So the year of that was when? Well, it would have been about 82 because I was about 17, 18, 17 going on to 18, so early 82. Okay. So uh, uh, am I incorrect to say your first TV debut was in 1992 with a cameo in the police drama Between the Lines? Uh, no, you'd be very incorrect to say that. Ah. Fact, I'm ashamed of you as my sister that you don't know well, this. I, I, I followed this with the um, um, uh, online. That oh, your first don't, don't, read, uh, but don't read anything online. Ask your brother. Well, that's uh, what I said to you. Send me your biography. I wanted to be up, up on it with you. Okay, well, the, the, the update then to that's that. a cameo. They said a cameo. No, no. My first TV job <clears throat> was on a television series for kids on what was CITV, Children's ITV, maybe oh. still, uh, oh. called Streetwise. And it was about bicycle couriers. Oh, that's why they didn't put it. Didn't yeah, put it. and a big full circle around that is, uh, on that show I met uh, an actor uh, called Andy Circus, And Andy and I, I don't know how many years later, ended up playing Othello and Iago, respectively, uh, at the Manchester Royal Exchange. So it was a very, it was strange oh. it again, because it's like, oh my gosh, now we're men. You know, then we were just, I was in my early yeah, I What they've done here, they've, all right, I've taken it from what the, the, the adult version of Patterson and Joseph, and as far as they're concerned, your first. Yeah, but I was 20, I was, I'd already left drama school by that point. So that was yeah. 1989. That was, that's a, that's that was 1989. 1989, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, that's ridiculous. But 1991, you uh, were second prize in Charles Ch um, Charleston Awards for 1990 performances. Yeah. In King Lear. Yeah, but what's weird about all that is that um, that whole awards thing, I never agree with awards. I don't understand them. I don't get them. Uh, I mean, I don't get them. But I also don't get them. <laughs> so, but the thing is, <laughs> you don't know, you don't physically get them. I don't physically get them. <laughs> right. um, uh, Screen Nations Award. You know who I'm talking about. <laughs> um, uh, still searching now. Uh, no, but, but, there, there was there was a such a uh, a kind of frenzy about awards when I first entered the profession that I hated them immediately. I remember going for this um, special award that. Uh, they're now called the Olivier's, but they were called the Society of West End Theatres. And they had us at drama school audition and uh, do a piece for them. And then they would give money, just give money outright to whoever won it. I can't remember how much it was. It might have been 1,500 quid. But I mean, that we're talking about 1988. That's not money. It was a hefty sum for, for nothing. And so when they auditioned me, I remember before I did my piece, yeah. They said, so why should you get this bursary? And I said, well, I shouldn't. I mean, I don't oh. need the money. Um, I live at home with my mum. I live at home with my mum. And uh, I don't need that money, really. Uh, so, you know, if you wanted to give it to somebody who really desperately needed the money, that would be no problem. So what they then did is they gave me a special commendation award and then they gave the money to or to whoever won the award. So I was always like that about awards. Like it doesn't make any sense giving me this. This isn't. I don't. You know. And I feel like you I know. Didn't you, that, Mom. you should have taken the award and given it. I to know, you. I know. I know. I know. Well, I mean, you know, if you get, I think if you get offered a, you know, a BAFTA or whatever, then that's that's slightly different because that's. So you're looking at the big awards. Mean no, I'm just saying they're, they're better run because a lot of these other awards they're about popularity or they, I mean actually the big awards are like that as well the Oscars are like that as well they're about popularity rather than excellence and how do you judge something like a performance that's yeah. your taste yeah I'm, I'm, I don't know whether we should do tv or theatre and I'm kind of thinking maybe we do theatre first because yeah okay well because that's where I started doing most of my stuff yeah so let's talk about theatre and, and we just talked about the Ian Charles Awards and then you won that for King Lear so let's talk about um uh the um ah, they didn't put it in the thing and when you played horatio to rafin's um hamlet yeah uh, he likes to be known as rafe fines i don't i just said to you ralph Fiennes hamlet so let's talk about how you felt doing that horatio because not only in england you went to america yeah i mean the thing about rafe's uh th that particular hamlet was a timing issue 
Because right. if you talk to somebody about Ray Fiennes now, um, younger people, people under 30 say, he doesn't really mean a lot to them except Voldemort perhaps. Um, but to our generation, he was a big sort of heartthrob. Uh, he was very, uh, uh, he was, he was screamed at by girls in the street. You know, when we finished in New York, I want to say that Rafe, 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 Rafe was quite a big deal. So the fact, that, so the fact that we went to New York was all about his fame, not about... Yeah, but um, I don't want to talk about your, your experience. And I remember you saying to us in the back, um, when you went to America and, and in the dressing room backstage, you know, certain celebrities came and visited yeah. Room and let's talk about you, please. So, uh, who did you have? Angela Bassett, I believe, was one of them. Yeah, I suppose what I was getting at was these people came because of Rafe's status at the time. He just on Shinder's list, so we had people like um, Angela Bassett, who you know, it, what's strange when you meet somebody like that is because you're so in love with their work, with who they are, how they look. When you meet them in person, you can either be cool about it or try to be cool about it, or you can just blather. So I just blathered. And I remember thinking halfway through, why don't you just stop now? Why don't you just stop talking? But, you know, you're so great, it's amazing. You know, there aren't that many black women who are really up there that you could name as household names. And you're like, please, your brain is going, stop. Um, she was very gracious and she was very lovely. And she said, thank um, you very much. Um, Larry Fishburne, <coughs> Lawrence Fishburne came backstage as well at some point and uh, he, I was playing Horatio, who's like Hamlet's uh, buddy, and he said, uh, "He said uh, Horatio," and I and I went, "Yeah." He went, "I learned a lot," and then he went, "Yeah." It's like I don't know what that means. I mean, that could be I learned a lot of what not to do on stage when you're doing Hamlet. Well, no, what to do on stage. Well, I learned a lot. Oh my God, you're an amazing actor! But I'll take the I'll take the second part. The second one too, Pat. Until I, meet, until I meet him again, and he goes, "No, let me explain." What I meant. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a feeling the Americans don't really do a lot of stage work. Even the big ones, even the the you know the big Hollywood ones, they don't do stage. They haven't grafted from the stage. It is what we do, as you do, Patterson. You graft. It's all about treading the boards and then getting up there. I don't think a lot of them have done that bit, and they uh, are admired by people who have done that, and particularly, if you will, a black British actor. So let's um, move on. I just want to say before you move on, okay. that I don't think it's true to say that the American actors don't have a theatre tradition in their background. It's just that their television and film industry is so big that it swallows them up very quickly before they've had a chance to maybe grow as much as we do over here, but even I that's changing for us. Yeah, I think that's what I meant. They haven't found yeah. themselves on the on the boards. Yeah, but that doesn't mean that they don't know theatre and don't know how to yeah. to they do it. Theatre, but, but they know it to know it. To yeah, know that's, it. that's very that takes years. But it, yeah. I have to I, say, it's the same here, Pam. Yeah, definitely. It's the same here. Yeah. 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 Cool. So let's go on to um, em the Emperor Jones. Oh gosh, that's, yeah, yeah. That, that's two. It's twenty fifteen, Pam. I know. 2015? No, The Emperor Jones was 2017. 20, 2007. Uh, I first did it in 20, uh, 2005. Oh. Uh, so they've, got that, they've got that wrong by about a decade. So, to, you see how you know, you can't trust things online. That's what I'm saying. That's why I said, you, can, you, says, you sent me a bio. And you yeah, did. That's exactly what our mum says. Don't put, don't put me in your Facebook. She means it because she doesn't want us online because she thinks it's nonsense. So you can't trust that. So 2005 at the Gate Theatre in Notting Hill, we put on this show, which was just about an hour long called The Emperor Jones. And it was about an African-American convict, Brutus Jones, who escapes to a Caribbean island and declares himself emperor when one day someone tries to shoot him and their gun jams. And they slightly believe him. And he says, I can only be killed by a silver bullet. So he makes one silver bullet, puts it in his own gun and says, I can only be killed basically by myself. Yeah. But when the play starts, they've rumbled him and they're beginning to you know, beat a drum in the forest and he has to run. And the whole play is about the disintegration of this man who thinks he's amazing. Yeah. He just looks a bit like Idi Amin with you know, medals and everything. And then you by the time- 
Yes, Stage, you were brilliant. I mean, <laughs> me, and, me and our other sister, uh, Jackie, watched that. I mean, you're just brilliant. But by, the time, by the time he's finished, can you remember, by the time he's finished, he's devastated. He's got, yeah. you know, he, he's got nothing. He's got, he, he has to take his boots off because he can't run in the forest with it. He has to take his jacket off. So he's like stripped down to nothing by the time he's finished. And he's been seeing images and visions and it's a brilliant play and it all takes place in about 59 minutes. Yes, and so much packed in. in yeah. that. And so. then two years later, because the Gate Theatre in Notting Hill is a tight, it's a beautiful theatre, tiny little pub theatre um, in Notting Hill, about 60 seats and maybe 70 at a push. And we had, it was always sold out, of course it was. But then a year later, the National Theatre asked us to put it on in the Olivier, which is like, I don't know, nearly 900 seats. Yeah. And it was incredible to, you had to change the design. I had to physically change what I was doing because it I don't know if you remember, but in, to, to, oh, yeah. it was huge. Like, because I don't know if you remember, but I was in a, like a trough and the audience were looking down at the gates and I was just bouncing as if I was bouncing off trees and, yeah. and, mangroves, and mangrove roots and things. And you were imagining all that in this trough filled with sand. And now you've got this wide, wide, like an amphitheater, big stage, like a rock concert stage and one little man, because yeah. I'm alone a lot in the play, running around trying to look like something's going on. So the yeah. design had you to did be it well. But you we did, did it. it, yeah, we did it, we did it. Well, um, we, we're talking about the big man now. When I called him Iggy, anyway, Ignatius Sanchez. The boss, just, uh, may I just uh, direct I'm you to, to an image yeah. of the boss? Well, we've got the image. I hope I oh, also got the image. I think I even sent it to. So, yeah, that's, that's nice. But just, uh, just so you know, like this is. Uh, <laughs> let's, have a, let's have a look at me now. So I'll show. Oh, there. Can you see that my image? Where's your image? There. Yeah. So that that's above my dining room table. That's what he has. That's what my brother has. It's above. Uh, that's room. above my dining room table, oh. and um, and that's um, that's a sort of reminder to me. Uh, how much I owe the fella because actually I've he's be made me become a writer in a way that I maybe wouldn't have done if I, I hadn't. I, I, I actually believe my brother that the spirit of this man Iggy is in, got into you, mate. I, I really I, do. I mean, I don't believe in in uh, I, you know spooky things, but I really do believe. I remember thinking this when I was in California and I had started to write the started to write the novel actually that I'm writing that I finished this summer. And I started writing it and thinking, it's like his spirit has taken over me and somehow I can't get rid of him can't. right now. We're going to go from <laughs> So we, but we play homage to that because we know that you, if you don't want me to spill the beans, um, that you're about to, you're in the process of writing. Oh, well, no, I finished writing the first draft anyway. <laughs> of a novel. Let me say it. Oh, uh, the novel. Yeah, the novel is um, is based on the life of Ignatius Sancho, but it's a work of fiction, um, a bit like in the line of Oliver Twist or David Copperfield. So I wanted to I wanted it to be a big old rolling story. So it takes place between you know his birth and say twenty eight. He died when he was fifty one. So it's like most of the first half of his life, uh, and it's called the Secret Diaries of Charles Ignatius Sancho, Volume One. Uh, I know, I said volume one, and I always say it like with a laugh, because like, who do you think you are? I mean, you, you haven't even had this published yet, and then you're talking about volume Yeah, we're going to do that person, but what you're going to write is good. You just said it's part fiction as well. So volume, yeah. in a minute, later on, we're going to ask you to give us details of, about that, when you're going to give us that. We want to get, get on a bit more with what you've done. in the. I know everyone keeps saying, but hold on, where did he star in? I have to do this because they're not going to not make me um thing if I don't. We have got you. You've been in Casualty. Mark Granger, was it Mark? Uh, Mark let's, Grace. Let's get the picture Mark, up. The yeah, picture his, up. Name, his name was Mark Grace. I've got to tell you, if I remember any of my characters from the past, I'd be really surprised. You just saw there that Survivors, where you was in Survivors as well, and you was in the Peep Show has Alan Johnson and also mm -hmm. Green. Alan Johnson is um, ja um, you know that Jade Marie's favorite, my eldest daughter's favorite character, and she takes a lot of her comedic roles. She takes it off a spoof of you, that character. You oh, know that's that. That's amazing. That's very very nice. Extremely versatile, Pat. That you can be 
extremely serious in your yeah. role. And then yeah. you're very comedic. And now a lot of actors will say, well, that's how you have to be. But they can't do it. But they can't do it. You have to have, to me, a certain gift to, to be able to do both. Well, yeah, I mean, you you guys helped me. Remember, we did a lot of plays and uh, we made up stories and you guys are really good at uh, entertaining us because we lived above a shop on a high street in Wilson Green, so we couldn't just be let out to sort of go running about the place. So we would just make up stuff. Uh, our elder sister, Glenda, was very good at doing things like bingo. Do you remember? She would make the cards. She'd get us all arts and crafts in for the afternoon. We'd play bingo or we'd play cards with each other. But you, in particular, Pam, and Jackie especially, um, and uh, and I, we would make plays up. And we would do spoof things. And sometimes we would do, uh, you guys would do dance routines. I remember you guys doing the locomotion at some point, you know. And, and this is kind of we our entertainment, and we did perform in front of our parents. We did do that. So it was like it was our, it was our music hall. It was our entertainment. So I think I learned to do a variety of things because we were all doing serious, serious, serious stuff as well. We tried to do serious drama as well. Yeah, and we and, and it was good. And and we spoke and we we read and, yeah. and read a lot of books. We yeah, read, yeah, you know Dickens and and what have you. We read. Yeah, they were in the house. Yeah, That's, didn't it? So let's yeah. go for. I'm gonna say to you all saying, just throw the pictures, and when you throw the pictures, the images work at Patterson's going to talk. Yeah, about. I'll, I'll refund them. Okay, just ah, <laughs> never, wear. Never, wear. never wear, never wear. This is the Marquis de Carabas, a 200 yeah. year old Marquis who lives in the underground of London. He is mysterious. He has a brother called Peregrine, played very famously by Adrian Lester, my brother from another mother, on the radio version of uh, the, 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 the sequel to uh, Never Wear, which was called How the Marquee Got His Coat Back. Because I wore this, sorry cows everywhere. Oh, Alan, sorry, I've got to, I've got to move on. Alan Johnson, yes, uh, I played him for, it seems like th it was 13 years altogether. Uh, nine series. Uh, I went from very, or well, quite hairy, to less and less hair. It's like, oh, Bembe, this oh, is Bembe. <laughs> who is a kind of amalgam of various characters that Jerry Conlon, who is one of the Guildford Four, um, uh, met in prison. So I played this sort of uh, a kind of ca Caribbean, could say Jamaican guy, who is uh, the friend of Jerry Conlon, played by Daniel Day-Lewis. Yeah, yeah, that was brilliant. This is um, Delhi, and uh, he's talking to Digger, who is his mate, but also the local crim, and he's, he runs a he runs a, um, a Caribbean kitchen. food shop El called Elmina's Kitchen, Ooh. which is also it's also the name of the slave port in Ghana where they used to hold the slaves before taking them across the Atlantic. Yes, yes. So uh, he's trying to save his son, who's not in the picture here, uh, from getting involved with Digger and yes. getting getting involved with somebody who's going to um, basically yeah kill you if you cross him. So it's a brilliant play, and it was it was written by Kwame Kweama, who now runs the Young Vic down there in Waterloo, brilliantly, of course, as ever. Uh, and it was it was at the National Theatre, and we had kids coming in from all over the place. Yeah. Okay, I'm having to move on because of the image now. So this is this is Wes, who was um, the the DCI uh, for uh, Law and Order UK's uh, two detectives. Uh, yeah. Yes, and I was rather unceremoniously uncere shot in the face in my last episode. Uh, you, well, you wanted to come up, Pat. You didn't want to stay too long. Is it? Well, I mean, it wasn't really given as a choice, and I would—I don't mind. I never mind. Uh, you know, when the job ends, I actually, really don't. I like moving on to different things. But yeah. it was just a joke. I tell, like, you know, if you really want, if you really hated an actor, like, how do you get rid of him from this soap opera? Let's shoot him in the face. But it was fine because um, it was a great storyline. The series ended. They yeah. did. We couldn't do it. I, I don't know whether it was because of Bradley, but they didn't want to do any more after that. I think they'd gone to the end of what they could do with it all. Is it not true that they say that um, do not stay in any series for too long because you'll be put? So yeah, that's the, that's the mindset I still have. It's too old fashioned probably now. But back in my day, if somebody played um, Minder, for example, which was a very popular show, the evening show, 
and then try to pop up in a you know a, a, a sitcom somewhere that might have been okay but if he was doing some sort of serious drama at that time it was been very difficult to separate him from the character he was playing um that doesn't mean it can't happen john thor did it with inspector morse and then Karen the qc there are certain actors who can do it but when you notice if you really look at the majority of actors they we they tend to play or well, we tend to play the same sort of roles and they may not be um you know the same accent or you know the same clothes or whatever but the same kinds of roles it's very difficult to be versatile in our job really because you don't choose as much as you'd like to yes okay well, let's let's look at that northern crosses i think um all saying you were supporting there this is it northern um, crosses i'm so proud of that work and i have news actually this is news that no one knows i haven't uh, spread this on twitter or anywhere else but i was told officially by the production company mammoth pictures that a second series has been commissioned of noughts and crosses oh. so you, you've heard it here folks exclusively second commission this afternoon show you weren't expecting it but here's the bombshell noughts and crosses will be back on your screens uh, don't know when, <laughs> don't know when because of uh, lockdown and um, coronavirus. Oh, the, 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 the thing. Let us, for those, Patterson, who may not be au fait, those ones in, um, you know, abroad haven't been au fait with this. This is mm. by a lady by the name of you. You give her a title and let's talk about this and then how the first series went. So Okay, so this, this is the series of novels um, right, right. written by Mallory Blackman. Yes. Um... I always want to say Dame Mallory Blackman. I think it's, you want to say that because I think she should have that. Well, it's only a matter of time. Um, but uh, Mallory uh, was our children's laureate. She is an extraordinary writer, written, I mean, thousands of stories. They're ridiculously huge uh, amount of work that she's put out. But she wrote a series of books about 20 years ago called Noughts and Crosses, which is like Romeo and Juliet, but set in, in a kind of futuristic world that imagines that Africa, the continent of Africa, or a conglomeration of nations, has taken over most of Western Europe 800 years ago and colonized Britain, which they now call Albion. And so now we come to the modern day and a black elite who are a minority, but the elite in charge are ruling quite draconianly, like a kind of uh, Jim Crow law um, over the white majority. And the white majority are revolting and there's the liberation militia who want to blow everything up. And so we're in that tense situation. And so there's a Romeo and Juliet in the middle of that. And that's my daughter. I play the home secretary, Kamal Hadley, and my daughter, Sefi is in love with uh, Callum, uh, who is my housemaid, Maggie McGregor's son. So there's a there's the whites who are called noughts and the blacks who are called crosses. And then no, there's no joining between the two. And that's my Kamal's idea that he wants more separation. So what? there's a big clash here. Yeah. So that's, that sets up the first six episodes that we've just I seen. It's been included in the um, uh, great hundred um, the British Britons. Marjorie Blackman's her name's in it. Mallory Blackman deserves to be there, yeah. Dame Mallory Blackman, as she will be known. And and Dame, yeah, and so we're not. So let, let, let's conclude, Patterson. What is happening now? As we go to the end back end of the year, yeah. About that you're writing the book, but 2021, what, what are we looking at? Well, I think the thing that I've noticed a lot about lockdown, to be serious for a moment, is that black people have had time to really examine their lives. Everybody's had time to examine their lives. I know a lot of creatives who've been looking at their work. What do I want to do? Actually, I don't want to do this anymore. And black people, because of what happened to George Floyd yeah. and Breonna Taylor, and we can go on, have also been able to have the time to look at their lives and ask themselves, you know, whether our lives matter to even us or ourselves. And I believe that, that that's what I want to do in the next year or two or three or for the rest of my life is, is draw on these collaborations. And there are some white people who are really on side and brilliant and who want to help and don't want to just be against racism. They want to be anti-racist. Yeah. So, and so there is a kind of um, movement and it's not a big movement with placards, but it's a kind of movement that I can feel in the arts for a lot of us to get together 
and use our ideas. So there's a TV idea for um, a series about Francis Barber, who was the uh, ward servant, really heir to Samuel Johnson, who created our dictionary, the greatest dictionary um, that was ever written at that point in the 18th century. And also, you know, around the time of Sancho. So Sancho would have known Francis. He was a mixed race child who had come originally, I believe, from St. Kitts. Yeah. But by the end of Johnson's life, this kid was his heir and he gave everything to him. It was an extraordinary story. So they're doing a, a TV series. Uh, somebody's producing that, trying to produce that, and want me on board. And I think I could do that. They've got Sancho in the story, but I've also got my things I want to do, but I want to collaborate with that. So there's a that's what I'm working on in trying to not just say, I'm doing my thing in my corner, you do your thing in your corner. I've got a lot of information that you could use. I'm sure you might be able to help me somewhere along the line. So let's try and collaborate a bit more instead yeah. of hiding our work and doing it in little corners. This comes from uh, the novel uh, in progress that I'm writing called The Secret Diaries of Charles Ignatius Sancho. And Sancho is about 24 years old at this point. He's in London, of course, and he is very afraid of meeting people of the black community because he hasn't before he's met royalty and he's met lords and ladies but he doesn't know these people and now he's going to meet a guy called john osborne and here he is at the black tar tavern in fleet street it was an inauspicious venue for my first encounter with black london at leisure i stood watching the comings and goings from across the street afraid suddenly that i would be lost in this world of foreigners and working men who sweat for their shillings I might know more than I did many years before about the ways of London at night, but I, I still held the habit of avoiding the taverns east of Covent Garden and the river, an old habit that I was breaking tonight in order to meet John Osborne. All the people that entered the tavern while I stood hesitant across the street were black, certainly brown. It would appear that no whites entered this tavern and I wondered if the proprietor was happy with that state of affairs or no. I mean, whatever the financial cost to him of having an exclusive clientele, his hostelry was well frequented this night. I braved the tavern which required no special knock and offered entry without cost or hindrance. White folks were not excluded here, I realized. They would merely choose not to enter an establishment that would render them a rarity. Pushing the doors fully open, I gazed at length from the lively scene before me. I was wrong. There were many white faces here, scrubbed clean, as was the whole ensemble, and dressed in the finest their pennies could buy. The music that emanated from inside was at first difficult to assess. Percussive sounds that moved in a time signature I was unfamiliar with. There seemed to be more than eight beats in each bar, and the bars were not clear to my unaccustomed ear. It was as if one of Handel's liveliest dance pieces was subject to an urgency that rendered the melody secondary to the rhythm, constant, imperative, wild, but there was something else to the music, something other than just the beat. It was the richness and detail of the harmonic layers that created a sense of abandon. The tavern was large and had a tall ceiling, unusually for an establishment on this street. It was not brightly lit, but the lamps around the room lent a warm feel to the space. No fire was needed in the large hearth on one wall of the room. Benches, chairs and a few small tables were placed on the edge of the room and the centre was given over to dancers, couples, white and black and all shades besides. They danced close without jackets or coats, but in shirt sleeves, including the women in their light chemises. Some dancers, I noticed, even brought their faces together, cheek by jowl, holding each other in a way that left no doubt that their bodies knew the other well. It was at once thrilling and shocking. I had been a week with the Montagues performing odd tasks and being blessed by the incapacitation of Duke George's valet. I had had social intercourse with those who knew how to behave. But these men and women struck me immediately as the most free of all societies in our eclectic city. Yeah. <laughs> that 
thank you, my friend. You could have gone on forever. You I know I could. It's a long novel. So we've got to wrap up, Patterson. It's fine. We could do it again. Let's do it again, sis. Let's do it again. Hey, no doubt we're doing it again. Yeah. Thank you ever so much. Nicely. And baby, I'll see you soon. See you very soon. Be kind to each other out there. Bye now. Thank you. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Patterson Joseph there. Oh, Lady Mayor. Wonderful. So we're going to take a quick break.